Well, good morning, everyone. Today's lecture is on um, invisible farmers. And what we're going to do today is take a historical overview to look at women and women's role in US agriculture. And the title for the lecture today on invisible women actually comes from a 1983 book, so ancient in, in your mind, but a book that's over 30 years old, by Carolyn Sachs. And Sachs' book was really groundbreaking in that she was one of the, the first to examine the contributions of women to US agriculture. And it was really this book that helped launch work by sociologists and other social scientists, um, rural historians and so forth, to look at the contribution of women that had largely been invisible up to this time. So this is a nod to that groundbreaking book. So one of the big questions we've been asking in this class and posing since the first day that we met is, why should we study women in agriculture? Why not just study agriculture? Why should we take a gender lens and think about the different roles that men and women play? I mean, why? That's what we've been asking. That's one of the big questions, right? And so what we've been arguing, or what I've been arguing, and what other scholars argue, is that why we want to study women in agriculture specifically, why we want to take a gender lens and not just talk about agriculture in general, is that women have always played a really critical role in feeding us, in clothing us, in sustaining rural communities where there are farm families, increasingly helping fuel our society, and this is everywhere, not just in the US. But when we just talked about agriculture, women's critical contribution was largely invisible. Or when we did see it, and we'll talk about this in the lecture, when we did acknowledge it, when we did see it, it often wasn't valued the same as men's contribution. Okay? And in some cases, it simply wasn't counted at all. Okay? In addition, the other component that we've been arguing of why should we study women in agriculture, why should we take a gender lens, is because there's an important gender gap in agriculture where women don't have the same access to resources that men do. They don't have the same access to productive resources like land and capital. They don't have the same access to opportunities and leadership education, and so forth. And if we want to address that gender gap, first we have to understand what is the issue? What's the problem? If you don't know about it, you don't know how to solve it. Okay? And for us to solve it, we specifically um, have to think about um, men and women and gender relations. So that's what we've been arguing in this class. So what we want to do today is we are posing two questions. And these are questions we're going to be answering throughout the lecture, uh, throughout the semester. So two questions. Why have women and their contributions been visible? And why and how is there a gender gap within agriculture? So these are the two big questions. And today, we're going to look at three examples to examine these questions. We're going to look at farmer identity, we're going to look at farm ownership, and we're going to look at farm labour. And specifically today, um, we're going to take a historical perspective on this. So moving forward with the semester, we're going to unpack these issues um, as they are today, but for us to understand how we got to where we are today, we want to look at what, is, what have these examples look like historically. So that's our goal today. And what I'm going to be arguing today, based on the social science and the historical literature that, that has looked at women, women's invisibility, the gender gap, what I'm going to be arguing is that 
There are many different reasons for this, but one important reason is this idea of the agrarian ideology. And by ideology, what we mean is a set of beliefs that underpin our po politics and, and economy. So this ide ideology is a set of beliefs. And the agrarian ideology, which I'm going to unpack uh, in a few minutes, but fundamentally what's critically important for you to remember is that this ideology, in terms of thinking about the family farm, assumes that the family farm is split into two different spheres, the farm and the household. And within these two different spheres, women and men play very different roles. Okay? So two spheres with men and women playing two different roles. So it's an ideology because ideologies are not necessarily grounded in truth. And so one of the things we're going to be looking at is how powerful this ideology is, and yet when we look at the reality on the ground, it doesn't really reflect what we see in terms of the family farm in the US. So, to put some boundaries on what we're talking about today, our focus is on the family farm. And we're really going to be looking, we're going to be picking up um, the history of, of the family farm since the 1860s, um, really from the time of the Homestead Act. So that are our boundaries. So if we're thinking about the family farm, it has some important geographical dimensions. So the family farm is most represented in the Midwest, where we are here in Iowa, and the Great Plains. And it largely affected white men and women. So on Thursday, we're going to turn our attention to the experience of African-American women, um, which also had an important geographical dimension in the South in terms of um, slavery and tenant and sharecropping agriculture, okay? So what we're talking about today is not a universal experience among all women everywhere, um, but has some important historical and geographical and structural dimensions to it. Okay, so what do we mean when we talk about the agrarian ideology and the family farm? So agrarianism is a very old ideology, thousands of years old, um, and this ideology is rooted in the belief that farmers have economic and political primacy over other industries, okay? That farming is the most valuable, the most moral of all industry and all economic endeavours. So in the US, when we think about agrarianism, it's Thomas Jefferson, our third president, um, who most clearly embodies the idea of agrarian ideology. So Thomas Jefferson spoke um, about agrarianism, he wrote about it, and was perhaps the most influential in shaping um, this idea. So when Jefferson um, talked about agrarianism, he framed it specifically in relation to family farms. So Jefferson, as we all know, was actually a, a slave owner, so perhaps there's some irony there. Um, but in terms of developing the republic in the US, Jefferson argued uh, in favor of um, you know, taking the land that was taken from Native Americans, that it should be disposed of among people who wanted to work it. So if you wanted to work the land, you should have the right to own your own property. Okay? So Thomas Jefferson is in favor of widespread ownership of... What are we going to do about this? Okay. 
So Thomas Jefferson was in favor of widespread ownership of the land. Right? So what's important when we think about how influential this ideology was is that if we think today, when most people think about farming, they think about family farming, right? Um, and in fact, there have been many different structural forms of agriculture in the US. We're going to talk about, again, slavery, sharecropping on Thursday as an example. So part of, part of the way we can appreciate how influential agrarian ideology was is that because it influenced our idea, our perception, that farming is predominantly family farming where the people who own the land should work the land. So agrarianism was what scholars call a gendered ideology. Okay? So in thinking about the family farm, Jefferson put forth the view that the family farm was two different spheres. So even though we call it family farm, we're thinking of this unit, but he had this view of it being two different spheres, the farm and the household. And within those spheres, women and men would play very different roles. So here, his view, which again we're arguing is incredibly influential, his view was that men would be the property owners, men would be the agricultural producers, and if you owned property, that gave you the right to engage in civic affairs for the early part of our history, also to vote. Um, and that women, their sphere would be the household. They wouldn't own property. Um, they would be responsible for caring for the house. Okay? They wouldn't be engaged in agricultural production. Um, and that their role was really to support the endeavours of um, the male farmer. Okay? So this was um, Jefferson's argument. Okay? <clears throat> so um, Jefferson's, um, his uh, um, uh, view of um, dispersion of the land um, and control of that land by family farmers, really, you know, when we think about our history here in the US, um, really it's the homestead act that we think of as being the fruition of this agrarian um, view of land settlement. So I know we all learn about the Homestead Act, um, which was enacted in 1862. This gave um, anyone who wanted to work the land, including women, um, the ability to own 160 acres. Uh, they were given that land for free, and so long as they worked it, they stayed on it for five years, and so forth, they were entitled to it. Okay, so this was a, a really important act, um, mostly um, in the Midwest and the Great Plains. And if we look at farm numbers, what we see is that um, this act, together with other things, development of the railroads and markets and, and uh, development of institutions like land-grant universities and so forth. But what we saw after that was the explosion in the number of farms. So in 1860, we had less than 2 million farms in the US. By 1935, when it peaked, we had almost 7 million, 6.8 million. That was the peak of the number of farms. Okay? So this was an incredibly important act, um, together with a whole number of other endeavours that led to the family farm. But again, the family farm um, was viewed as having these distinct spheres with these distinct um, roles for men and women. So what scholars argue is that when we think of the agrarian ideology, and again, we're going to illustrate this through our examples today, is that this ideology has been extremely influential. If we look at our social institutions, if we look at policies, laws, education, extension, and so forth, we see it reflected in those. If we look at attitudes and values and beliefs, whether individual or familial or community uh, or societal, 
we see this ideology um, um, permeating through our attitudes and beliefs. And again, this idea okay, that within the family farm, the family farm has primacy. We value it enormously, but within that, we have clearly different roles for men and women who operate within different spheres. Okay. So, we're going to look at three different examples to illustrate the agrarian ideology. And our goal today is to bring it back to those questions we pose. So what we want to try and think about is what effect has this agrarian ideology had on one, women's invisibility within agriculture, and two, the gender gap. Okay. So if we think about why does it matter if the farm is separated from the household? How does that influence women's visibility? How does it influence the gender gap? Okay, that's what we're going to be thinking about. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at um, agrarian identities. And we're going to look at um, a, a short... Um, clip of a commercial of So God Made a Farmer. How many of you had see, have seen the, Maybe I should ask, how many of you have not seen this commercial? Okay. Oh, okay. A um, small handful have not seen this commercial. So this was a commercial that ran during the 2013 Super Bowl. Okay. And it was advertising. Does anyone even remember what it was advertising? Okay. What kind of trucks? Dodge. Dodge. Dodge Ram. Dodge Ram trucks. Okay, so at, at the end of the commercial, you'll see a truck. I think you see other trucks as well. So it ran during the Super Bowl, um, and it was an incredibly um, emotional and impactful commercial. People loved it. Since that time, there's been over 23 million views of this commercial. Articles have been written about it in the media. There, you can go and read so many comments. People absolutely loved this commercial. So we're going to watch it, and what I want you to do is I want you to think about the images in the commercial, but I also want you to think about the language that's being used. So what you're hearing is actually a speech by Paul Harvey, who was a conservative radio broadcaster. Um, and the speech is from 1978. So we can um, see that it's a few decades old and it's been used. And as we watch it and as we listen, what I want you to think, and you can you know, jot down some notes because you're going to come back and share it with the rest of the class, is one of the reasons I like to show this video is I think it's a really nice example of the agrarian ideology. And so think about how is the farmer represented? How is the identity of the farmer represented? What kinds of traits are associated with the farmer? How are men and women represented in this commercial? Okay. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an axe handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay, wire, feed sacks, and shoe scraps, who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon and then pain in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. 
God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink-combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and rake, and disc, and plow, and plant, and tie the fleece, and strain the milk. Somebody who'd bail a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing. Who would laugh, and then sigh, and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. Okay, so, so God take... made a farmer. Whoops, I cut it off. Sorry, George. Um, so take a minute and you can chat with your neighbour or not chat with your neighbour, but think about um, how the agrarian ideology is captured um, in this film and think about how um, farmers are represented, how the role of farm, the identity of the farmer is represented. So don't worry about writing down too much. It's more just, you know, jot some notes to think about. So so who wants to volunteer and, and uh, tell us what you saw or what you heard in terms of how the farmer and farming is represented. What were, what are some immediate things? Yeah, Masala. I mean, the audio is directed extremely towards men, since it, all it does is just reference the farmer and the male. But then the images come back and it shows females doing odds and ends work. So it's extremely bipolar to what is actually being presented. Okay. Okay. So the text and the images focus largely on men. Very nice. Good. What else? like at the beginning it started with like non-gender language like it needed to be someone who blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think towards the end we did get into that more man ideal but I think it did still shine a light on women especially since like um, like this was from back in 19, 1978 um, not nearly as much as it could have but I, I don't think they were ignored either okay so women weren't entirely excluded from it, and in fact, the language at the beginning was sort of all inclusive um, and thinking about it historically. Yeah? I think until the end, the language is very, like, not gender biased until it says, and when the young boy looked at his dad and said, I want to do what dad does. And that's when it kind of, like, you get the fact that it's a male, but it's just that image in our mind and, like, the masculine voice, like, Parham Harvey's voice is obviously very deep. That kind of gives you the idea that the farmer is a male. Mm -hmm. Because the images, they show a variety of different people from older men and women who are hardworking, and you can tell they spend their days in the field to like the next generation of farmer with the young girl standing in front of the fields. So I think it's kind of the voice that is that's a, given it. That's a really nice point. Okay, so all the ways we pick things up, so how different might we have interpreted this image if it had been a, a, a woman's voiceover, and of course it's Paul Harvey, it's a man, but then perhaps that automatically makes us think that what we're talking about is men, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I really specialize gender bias with the, the voiceover because it, even with that one part, I feel like every dad and every Okay, so incredibly influential. So again, 
you know, part of it is because we're looking at this historic, so they're taking a historical speech and putting it on to contemporary images. Did anyone have a different view or another take on how, so thinking about these different spheres, so we're talking about family farming. So largely what we saw was the farm, right? What sort of images of the household did we see in terms of this family farm? Where the house is integral, right? Integral to family farming. Yeah, Masa. I mean, and also like the video showed some of like women mend the house together. Like they cook the food, they bring it out to the guys in the field, and then they go back and work on the house. They kind of bring the family together through the house. Yeah, but it's the the male at the head of the household, and the language then is bringing them together. Yeah, Maddie. I think like what she's saying. Part of that language too is it says as part of the farmer's job is to mend the family together or pay the family together. Yeah. And so it's almost talking about the same person. So if you already like think that there is gender bias between that, then you do kind of see them as the head of the household person, the woman holding everything together. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Okay. So um, one of the things, you know, when we think about family farming, we think of the household as really integral. And we'll talk about that um, as we move through the lecture. The household is less visible um, in this image. The focus is more on the productive aspect, the farm aspect. And if you look at women, so we're talking about family farming, right? Family farming. Um, women, I think there are three images of women. Um, out of the 18 or someone counted them up once okay so there are some women um, but there's not many of them so men um, uh, predominate in the images and again um, as one of you commented the image we see is that um, the boy will take over the farm and of course most of us as, as was mentioned you know often want our children to um, uh, take over what we've done um, but we can also interrogate that, which is what we're going to do. So if we think about the agrarian ideology, in this clip, um, um, the intent of it was to really help illustrate how both historically, because you guys pointed out that the speech is historical, 1978, um, both historically, but even today, the power um, of the agrarian ideology, where we see these spheres differently and we see the roles of men and women on family farms as quite distinct. And we can think about that in terms of the identity of the farmer. So when we um, talk about farmers, when we talk about family farming, um, the farmer is typically identified as male. Okay? So we have these strong images of men um, often working independently, um, you know, working outside, working with crops and livestock and machinery. So these are the primary images that we get of the family farm, that the farmer is a male. And when we think about the traits that are associated with the farmer, they are masculine traits. Okay? So things we associate with men often, being very strong, um, being independent, being tough, being persistent. You know, you could see the men in the images. They were, you know, creative with the different challenges they had. They were resilient in overcoming um, the challenges that nature and others presented to them and so forth. And, and part of this helps us again, come back to that idea of agrarianism, uh, it helps us recognize um, why the status of farmers is so high in the US. So if you do a survey of the American public, farmers have a really high status, okay? and family farms have a really high status. And part of it is because of this idea that you know, farmers embody so many of the traits that we think are really important and that we value in the US. Again, independence, hard working, resilient, these kinds of language that we use when we talk about farmers. 
And this is good, this is important. The critique is that when we look at this, the contributions from women, and even children, but that's not our focus today, the contributions of women are largely invisible. Okay. So again, we're talking about a family farm. A family farm. Not a man's farm, a family farm. Okay. And where are the women? Okay, so we didn't see them a lot in that video clip. When we talk about women, um, when we talk about women on family farms, we don't call them farmers. We don't call them, you know, farm women. Um, historically, and predominantly today, we call them farm wives. Okay? So women on family farms, um, how we identify them is not in relation to the work that they do, but their marital relationship. Okay? So it's different for men and for women. And we can see the historical roots of this. Again, Jefferson um, and others at that time argued strongly that white women should not be engaged in farm production. Okay. This was not the view they had of black women, which we'll talk about on Thursday, but in terms of white women on family farms, the argument was that they should not be working unless they were in desperate dire straits, their husbands had died or they were in poverty. Okay? Women's place was in the home as wives and as mothers, supporting their husband, um, taking care of the household and the children and so forth. And to justify this, um, women's role, um, you know, we associate what they do with strong traits of femininity. So, one of the things we can ask ourselves is, so what? Right. So what? Men are farmers and women are farm wives. Hey, men are responsible on the farm, women in the household, who cares, really? What scholars argue is that um, this belief that women didn't really contribute to farming and farm production, that their role on the productive side was largely invisible, had very real material consequences. And we could say very real consequences for men, but we could also argue for families. Okay, very real consequences. So the example I want to give, because it's related to us being here at Iowa State University, is this idea that men and women operated in these very different spheres had implications for the kind of education that men and women received. Okay. So... In 1914, the Smith-Lever Act was passed. And the Smith-Lever Act um, established the Agriculture and Home Economics Extension Service. And the idea with the passing of this act was that land-grant institutions such as ours, Iowa State University, would provide education um, for farm families. Okay? And this education would be based on science, and the idea was that it was to help them be successful farm enterprises. But because of this agrarian ideology, when men and women operate in these different spheres, women were just taking care of the house and it was men who were the farmers, um, the education that was established um, had different programs for men than for women. Okay? So men learned you know, the science, in terms of what was needed in terms of farm production, how to grow crops, you know, how to look after livestock, deal with machinery. Women learned the science um, for the domestic sphere, how to cook, how to preserve. In the photo that you see here um, from State Agricultural College in Colorado, women are learning how to make butter, which was seen as women's preserve. Does it matter? So the problem is that 
it didn't reflect men and women's actual lives on the farm. Okay, so that's what we're arguing here, is that we have this ideology that separates men and women, that makes women's contributions invisible, that then has material consequences and wasn't a real reflection of the lives on family farms. So this is a quote. The photo was not the person speaking, but I thought it'd be nice to have a photo up there. So this is a woman, she wrote in a letter, I weigh 120 pounds, I milk seven or eight cows, night and morning, run a separator, get breakfast, dinner and supper, do most of the cooking for five people, do all of the washing and cleaning, do most of the garden work and rake some and haying, I mend, read and such, but I don't have time to rest as we have a 200 acre farm. And this letter comes from a series of letters from women who were writing saying, I can't get the kind of education I need. I mean, I'm, that's good to learn things about making butter and, and skills I need in the kitchen, but I do so much more than that, and I, I need to be learning these other things. So the education is not reflective of my real needs. One of the other arguments was that um, because women's role in juggling both the productive and the reproductive side of things was that their concern, which at this time was primarily calls for more labour-saving technology, was not being heard. So women were saying, we don't just work in the household, we're doing all these different roles, and we need you guys to be investing. You know, we need the government and we need land-grant institutions to be investing in equipment that can save us time, not just the men on farms. So this notion of these different spheres, we can look at, and I've just pulled out a couple of examples to illustrate um, how strong this ideology is, that we can look at policy, education, we can look at art, we can look at media, and we can see its influence. So you guys know this painting, right? So where's Grant Wood from? Yeah, Iowa. Okay, Iowa. Okay. So this is one of the most, probably one of the most famous paintings in the U.S. Okay, had lots of um, people have poked lots of fun and done lots of things to this image. But this is a really well-known um, piece of American artwork from the 1930s. So how is the idea? So how is the representation of the farmer? and the farm wife conveyed here. How do we know one's a farmer and one's a farm wife? Yeah, the man has a pitchfork, right? That doesn't help you cook very well. So yeah, man has a pitchfork, what else? Yeah. The wife seems to have like an apron on. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, she does have an apron on. You can see she has a nice apron. And he has his overalls. So this is actually a farmer and his daughter, although most people you know, don't know that. You'd have to probably go and read about it. So most, most people look at that and they think it's a farmer and his wife. Okay? But again, here's an image of the farmer. He's you know, um, doing farm work. And on this family farm, um, she's the wife, the daughter, um, doing non-farm work. She's got an apron on. Here's an example from... Um, an advertisement, a post-World War II advertisement for a farm oil tractor. Again, this idea of these separate spheres between men and women. So the guy's going off on his lovely new tractor. Um, he's going off to farm. And the wife has got her apron on and her nice dress. And she's going to stay home and take care of the domestic sphere. She's the wife. She's the mum. And she'll also be looking after the daughter again. Okay, so perpetuating this notion among society at large about this view of the family farm that didn't exist. Okay? And I put this, this is a recent example from 2017. I thought this was interesting. Again, just thinking about the language that we use to describe men and women on family farms. So this was a, um, from a local newspaper, um, and it was an article about an award these two um, the Long Neckers had received, the 2017 Cattlemen of the Year Award. And you can see that the Long Neckers, um, they finish 
calves, they have a cow calf operation and they operate a fertilizer company. And you delve into the article and it talks about them working together. So they own everything together, they work together, they describe them as a tag team. But the man is identified as a farmer and she's identified both in the title and within the text as the wife. Now, I want to be careful because, you know, for many women, this role of farm wives, we're going to look at this more later on in the class, um, this idea of farm wives gives them status and prestige as well. Okay? So it's not to diminish this title or to negate it in that sense. Again, the main argument is that it doesn't really reflect um, accurately the role that women do on farm farms. <coughs> Family farm, so it makes um, it can make their contributions um, partially invisible. So the second example I want to look at, in terms of thinking about, you know, how is the agrarian ideology um, contributed to um, making women's role invisible or contributing to this gender gap? So if we think about the gender gap within agriculture, one of the most significant gaps is that in terms of land ownership. Okay. So historically, men um, have had access to land and ownership of that land, and women have not. Historically, remember, we're doing a historical overview, and we're going to look at how that's changed um, later in the class. And this is not <coughs> insignificant. This is materially incredibly important because land um, is so significant in terms of generating wealth for individuals or families, um, can provide power, status. Um, in the early days, of America, of course, it meant that you could vote when you could only vote if you owned a property. Okay. So land everywhere is an important. So what the US, um, um, uh, what we inherited were um, laws and views from Britain um, that were then embodied in agrarian notions around the family farm, and that is that property um, should be owned by men. Okay, so what we can call it, it was a patriarchal system. Okay, patriarchal system. So land is owned by men, controlled by men, and passed down through generations of males. And why I like to bring up this example is it's a really nice example of the power of social norms, which is what we were talking about last week. Okay? So, um, initially, women weren't allowed legally to own land or property once they married. Okay? And this was the law of coverture. Okay? So women, when they married, were considered then to become really an appendage to the male. She didn't have an independent existence. So wives were not allowed to own property and they weren't allowed to earn their own income. Okay? They really sort of were just a dependent on the male. So that was the law in the US, which we inherited from Britain. Those laws were overcome. Women fought against them and they were overcome in the 19th century. Um, but then what we've seen is the power of social norms, which if you remember from last week, are those informal rules, informal rules about how we're supposed to behave. And what we said last week is the social norms can actually be more powerful than the law themselves in terms of influencing how we think and our values and how we behave and so forth. And they can be really difficult to challenge. So casting our mind back to Jefferson and thinking about the historical roots um, of these social norms, again, the idea was that women were supposed to be subordinate 
to husbands, um, that in contrast to men working on the land do not entitle you to property. And what we saw, you know, right through until the last couple of decades was considerable um, inequities between men and women's ownership and control of land and related assets, okay? So women really held joint ownership of the land. They really signed for loans. Um, vehicles and equipment were really in their names um, and legal records um, often didn't account for their economic contributions. So important, important discrepancies um, between men and women's control and ownership and power over property and related assets. So what this meant was, that was fine probably, so long as your family relationships were good. What happens though if a marriage dissolves? Or women want to work, or women want to make some different decisions about their property. So this is a quote um, from the 1970s, so for me this feels like very recent history, um, that explains for 20 years Mrs. Ellen Scow worked alongside her husband to keep their Wisconsin farm profitable. During a typical 12-hour day, she milked the cows in the morning and evening, cared for the chickens, helped plant, harvest, strip the tobacco crops. She regularly baled hay and drove the tractor. The skiers agreed to share their farm revenues until they divorced in the 1970s. And the court ruled that all profits from the farm belonged to Mr. Scare. In marriage, he was legally <coughs> entitled to his wife's services. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll have some time to come back later in the semester and look at, um, so we have these laws related to land. Um, the major ones were overturned in the 19th centuries, but different pieces of them didn't get overturned until the 1980s for some of them, okay? So women could be left with nothing. So you're in a family farm, you work, you think you're sharing something, but if you divorce, um, it's all for naught because you're not entitled to the land. Um, all the profits from your labor. So, thinking about today, um, what we've seen um, since World War II is, and how many, remind me, how many of you are from farms again? A whole bunch of you are from farms. Lots of you are from farms. So you know um, that since World War II, um, farms have, um, we've had a lot fewer farms, right? So peaked in the 1930s. So the number of farms have declined but the farms that have remained have become larger and more specialised. If you want to be successful today, you have to have a pretty large farm that's fairly highly capitalised, fairly highly specialised in <coughs> crops or livestock and so forth. What that means is that for anyone who wants to get into farming, good luck, right? If you don't inherit the farm, it's almost impossible to get into farming. To raise the kind of capital to buy the land. What's an acre of land going for now in our, Iowa? 8,000? 15. Yeah. So it depends how the quality of the land, eight to $15,000 an acre. Okay. Um, so to be able to purchase land, the machinery, the equipment, so forth, almost impossible um, to get into farming. So, even for men, it's hard. So, if you want to get into farming, you better hope that you were born into a farm family okay? and that you get to inherit it. So, for men, it's hard. It's even harder for women. Okay? So, I put this up here just to sort of illustrate again there are no laws barring women from inheriting land. No laws. Okay. And if you divorce now, it's going to be completely different than what confronted Mrs. Skier. Okay. 
But there are important social norms which mean that even today, daughters are less likely to inherit land than sons are, even if they want to inherit it. Okay. So how would you explain that? How would you explain it? What do you think attributes for this difference in terms of, you know, how would you explain why boys are more likely to inherit land than girls, sons than daughters? How would you explain it? Are they just born that way? Huh? I have an older brother. Yeah. And he always helped my dad on the farm and he'll definitely take it over one day. So it's just kind of how it fell. <laughs> okay. So you have a brother, he's likely he always helped your dad on the farm and he's likely to take over the family farm. It's just the way things go. Uh, any any other thoughts? Myself? I feel like Boys are more interested in farming earlier than girls. Okay, that boys are more. Is it born that way? Is it genetic? I don't know. I just like how they like. They just like are more willing to jump in right away and get their hands dirty. While like girls, especially being your age, are more likely just to stay inside and stay in their comfort zone. Ah, so girls are likely to stay inside, not want to get dirty, and boys are just more interested. Mary, I feel like that's going off of that not to feel like the opposite trail, but that's just forced into what we're supposed to do. Like people just assume that we want to stay inside because when I was growing up, I wanted to go outside, but my uncle would be like, no, stay inside and play with some Barbies or something. Play with some Barbies. That'll help prepare you for, <clears throat> I'm not sure what Barbies help you prepare no, for, but. It's just what society wants to mold us into. Right? I think societal norms um, definitely exist for the men too. Like women are expected to like, be indoors and be the nurturers. Men, when they um, when they get of age, they're like, you're going to take over the farm, so you need to come out, you need to learn how to operate a machinery, you need to learn how to do this, and then um, that social norm definitely plays into them inheriting the farm later on. Yeah, very nice. Okay, great, great comments. Um, and if we look at the research, the social science research on this, which helps us understand what is it? Why even today, when we think of men and women being equal, that we see this discrepancy, this gender gap in terms of who's inheriting the land? Is it really that we're born different? Is it really simply, can we explain that women aren't interested? And so what you guys articulated is exactly right. Is we can look at the socialization process, and we talked last week about how you know, all kinds of people, not just our parents, but our neighbours, our uncles, our grandparents, television, influence, you know, how we think we should behave, what roles we think are appropriate, you know, whether we should dis you know, um, display more masculine or feminine traits. And these are things that, again, no one tells us we're supposed to do it. We learn it. We pick it. We pick up social cues from our mothers and our fathers and and other people about what we're supposed to behave. And maybe if we try and bend those rules, we get reprimanded. So if we look at the family farm. We see the power of the socialization. Where you're exactly right. Right from the time boys are little, um, there's just this, you know, again unspoken assumption. But boys are encouraged. Um, to you know, get on the equipment, learn how to use the equipment, play with the machinery, engage in productive um, farming in a way that women are not. And when people look at you know, what's one of the biggest obstacles to women getting into farming and to taking over land, it's machinery. Okay? So if women haven't learned from parents and others you know, to be comfortable around machinery, to know how to use it, you know, attach implements, fix it, okay, talk about it, you know, deal with the smell and everything. If you're not familiar with that, it can make women both feel inadequate because then they're dependent on men to deal with the equipment and it can make other people not see women as real farmers. So machinery is this real 
um, barrier between um, women seeing themselves as farmers and other people seeing themselves as, as farmers and is a reflection of the socialization process. So the last example I want to talk about in terms of thinking about this agrarian ideology is in terms of farm labor. Man must toil from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. That's a very old adage we've probably all heard some variant on. And so here again, we want to think about how is this idea, this agrarian idea, that the farm and the household should be separate, men and roles should be separate, how has this contributed to women's invisibility and a gender gap? And what we're going to argue, or uh, what scholars argue based on the research, is this idea, and we've already hinted at it through looking at that commercial and talking about the farmer identity, is that the problem with this ideology is it doesn't capture women's full contributions, which means that we often, as a society, aren't aware of how women contribute, or when we know what they do, we don't think that they're actually of the same value as what men contribute on family farms. And I put up this quote by Fink because I think it's so lovely. The magnitude of women's input and its centrality to farm production have not been carefully assessed in a system that used women so fully but evaluated and rewarded them so meagerly. Okay, so not fully accounting for women's um, contribution and <coughs> acknowledging it and rewarding it. So we're going to look at two um, aspects of this, the productive role and the reproductive role. So the, the productive role is, is typically, within this ideology, what we think of when we're thinking about what happens on the farm. So the productive role is you know, what we produce for market, for home consumption, for an income. It's the work um, that we do that is considered to have some productive value, use value, exchange value, and so forth. So if we think about, historically, what women have contributed on family farms, according to Jefferson and other proponents of agrarianism, women are simply in the home, right, doing the domestic labours. In fact, all the research tells us that's that is not at all what women have done historically. Now, their roles have changed. <clears throat> okay, so we can look, you know, women for long periods of time till the early part of the 20th century were engaged in, they were responsible for milking the cows, collecting eggs, raising chickens. It could be for home consumption, for the market. They were primarily responsible for growing, preserving food, the household, maybe selling some of it. And increasingly, as we talked about, as farms have become more specialised, women's roles have also shifted. Okay? So now, you know, how many mums are primarily responsible for the bookkeeping and the accounting? Does anyone have a mum? Hands up. Okay, so a bunch of you. Okay? So a bunch of you from family farms, your mums, are primarily responsible for the bookkeeping, the accounting. That's a role that's strongly associated with women. And what we see increasingly today is women's importance in terms of off-farm labour. If you look at USDA data, United States Department of Agriculture data, there's an enormous proportion of family farms that could not sustain themselves without the contribution of off-farm labour. Of someone in the household or more than one person working off-farm to bring in an income to help sustain the farm business. How many of you have someone in your family farm who works off-farm to help bring an income? Okay, so a chunk of you. Okay? So really important. So again, we often think of that as separate, but the family farm often couldn't survive without that income. What's really interesting when we look at how women talk about themselves, how other people talk about women, is how internalised it is that, okay, they might be doing this productive labour, but it's not really 
maybe what um, is their primary job or they should be doing. And so the language that gets used typically talks about women as being more in a supportive role, as the helper, the helpmate of the farmer. And we see this over and over again. It's fascinating. Okay, so we see language such as filling in, helping, doing what needs to be done. This is how women and other people talk about women when they're doing productive labour in relation to the family farm. So this is, uh, this is actually from a book that came out this year, but here's a photo of a woman operating a tractor. Um, it says she's assisting with field work. She's not doing field work. She's not farming. She's not, she's assisting. Okay. Um, this is from Sachs, who I mentioned earlier, did some of the most important groundbreaking work um, that helped make visible women's actual role on the farm. She did a lot of in-depth interviews with women, and what was really revealing, again, was how women talked about themselves. So here is a woman saying, you know, I don't help a lot. You know, that idea, I'm just helping, I'm assisting, you know, just when I'm needed. And then she goes on to explain everything she does. I care for the calves, I bottle feed them. Every day I carry the milk out. Also I drive the tractor when he, my husband, needs me. I shovel corn at harvest time. During haymaking, I'm out there every day and sometimes I work in the fields. Okay, so this is just, I don't do a lot, I'm just helping out. But we can imagine if, what would happen if she wasn't contributing, okay? Um, she wasn't contributing. Is this simply helping or is this an essential contribution to sustaining the family farm business? So again, part of what we tried to demonstrate today is that you know, how we talk about men and women, how we imagine them to be on the family farm, have very real material consequences. And the example to illustrate this is the United States Department of Agriculture census, which is it's conducted every five years, um, and it tells us, I don't know, with everything we need to know about farming, but a lot. It calls itself the voice of agriculture. So the census has been around since 1840, and it tells us who's farming, where are they farming, how much are they farming, what are they farming, how much are they earning, a lot, okay? But because women, because of the power of this ideology that women didn't actually contribute to the productive side, so the USDA didn't even bother collecting data on them because it was assumed that they didn't really play an important role. So we don't even have to count them. They weren't counted till 1978, almost 140 years later. How many censuses were done? To understand the full picture of agricultural production, ah, but we won't talk about half of that. I don't know how many of you have worked for policy makers or commodity groups or researchers to know how important this data is and how widely it's used to develop policy, programming, extension, education. So again, if you're thinking, we had all this information to develop all these important things, but we didn't include women, it can lead to those things where, again, we'll train women how to make butter, but not how to care for livestock. So women played an important role in terms of productive labor, but also reproductive. And so, um, so this is what, um, again, you know, agrarians think this is the appropriate role for women. Um, this is what they do and this is what they should do. They shouldn't be working in productive labor. They should be at home, um, raising children, cooking, cleaning, washing, and so forth. Uh, the point here is that you know, women, regardless of how much work they had to do on the farm, still had to come home and take care of their domestic responsibilities, right? So it doesn't matter how much you were helping or assisting, 
there were still kids to feed and food to cook and you know, beds to make and so forth, which this poem illustrates um, where this woman is saying, when she returned home after working the fields all day, her domestic toils incessant play. She still had to cook, make beds, feed the swine, mend clothes and so forth. So people talk about this idea of the second shift. There's also this idea of the third shift, but the second shift. So it doesn't matter how much you've worked all day, you still have all these domestic responsibilities um, awaiting you. So the point here is that we know that women do this work, we often don't acknowledge how indispensable it is um, to sustaining the family farm, to the success of a family farm. We wouldn't have family farms if we, if we just had men on farms, right? You actually need families to reproduce the next um, family who's going to um, inherit that farm. Um, Women's domestic role was also important in terms of um, freeing men to do other tasks. I don't know whether you picked this up, because um, Paul Harvey talked quickly, but he has this line about, you know, the, the farmer worked all day in the fields, and then he comes and eats supper, and then he goes and spends all evening at the school board. What doesn't get mentioned, comes in and eats his supper, no mention of who did the shopping or the cooking or the preserving or growing the food or cooking it or doing the dishes. Who did all the work that allowed you to come into the fields, who allowed you to go after the school bed? Who put the kids to bed and bathe and so forth? So again, it's not to diminish either people's roles, which are both important, but to fully acknowledge both of them. Okay? So this idea that women's reproductive work is often undervalued, um, that... It's seen not as work, but as natural. It's like women, you know, women just do this automatically. You know, we're naturally mothers. We naturally want to care. We naturally want to cook and clean and so forth. <coughs> so what I want to finish up with now um, is in this class, moving forward, we're going to um, think about are the different ways that this agrarian ideology is, is changing, has been challenged and is changing. And what I want to do is just to think about, okay, we've been thinking about this history since 1860s. What's a historical example of how this agrarian ideology was challenged? What's a historical example that shows how women challenge this idea um, that, you know, um, women just worked in the household, that we didn't contribute anything important, that we're not capable of being farmers and so forth. So I just wanted to finish up with this as a little bit of fun. I think we've all heard of Rosie the Riveter, who is the cultural icon in the US, um, showing um, the important role of women who you know, went to work in the factories and the shipyards and so forth when men went off to war. And the farm equivalent were the farmerettes and the tractorettes. Have any of you guys heard of the farmerettes or the tractorettes? Has anyone heard of them? No, far no historians in the class. Okay. This would be a fun project, I think. So in World War I, we had the establishment of the Women's Land Army. Okay. So... Um, this was an initiative to take women from the city or towns or from farms themselves um, to work in farm roles. Okay? And they were known as farmerettes. Okay? Here's women who shockingly wore p pants, um, which you didn't do in those days, who wore pants but learned how to you know, drive horses, who ploughed, who harvested, who planted and so forth, who did the roles um, that were necessary in terms of farm production. And of course there were all those questions. Are women strong enough? Are they capable? God, won't the smell put them off? I mean, women don't like getting dirty, do they? So here are these women challenging those stereotypes about appropriate roles for men and women. And the second one is from World War II, um, which was the Tractorettes. And this was an initiative... Um, that um, International Harvester was centrally involved in, <coughs> the equipment dealer. 
Um, and this was an effort again, you have men going off to war, who's going to produce the food? Okay, how can we sustain the farm? Okay. So we needed more women to be engaged um, in farm work. And so this is a whole program. Um, there's these beautiful pictures of class, outdoor classrooms and so forth, but you had dealers go out and uh, train women, educate women, so women had to learn how to um, operate machinery, attach implements, they had to learn how to fix the equipment, and of course do different farm work if they weren't um, familiar with it. So again, a nice example. Um, we often assume a lot about what we think men and women can do, should do, and often we continue to think that until something disrupts our thinking, and I think these historical examples about what women did in World War I and World War II, which we know they're doing all the time within the family farm, it's just that the rest of society often doesn't know it because of how we talk about farm families and men and women. So how is how are many of these ideals, beliefs, and stereotypes challenged? So just to conclude, um, so what we're trying to argue today is this agrarian ideology, um, you, know, you know, which has been um, with us, um, which Jefferson was a powerful proponent of, has played a really important role in shaping how we as a society um, think about family farms, how we as a society think about um, the appropriate roles for men and women on those farms, how we identify who's a real farmer, and implicit in that, who's not a real farmer. And I put the quote up by Brant because I really like this, because I think um, it captures what we're trying to say about the agrarian ideology, that the way we speak about men and women on farms may not correspond to the way they really are. So if you're from a farm and you know what your you know, mums, dads, aunts, uncles, grandparents and grandmothers know, um, you'd have a sense of how problematic this agrarian ideology is, that it doesn't accurately reflect um, what takes place on a family farm and women's full contribution. So again, coming back to why does this matter? Um, you know, why do we care? Um, so we've tried to highlight a couple of examples of where um, this ideology has had important social and material consequences. Okay? Where women's critical contribution is often invisible or undervalued, and that this has had consequences in terms of uh, the kind of education women might get, whether women are expected to take over the farm. We can think of other examples that we can talk about later in this semester, but things, we'll have guest speakers come in and talk about this too, that if you're not considered a farmer, why would a bank loan you money? And what we'll find is that women were discriminated against in terms of getting bank loans because bankers and others didn't see them as real farmers, or they didn't have the collateral because their name is not on the bank. Um, when we look at farm organisations, who's leading them? Who's organising them? So very real consequences. Not seeing women as um, full participants, full contributors on family farms has had very real consequences in terms of limiting women's full participation and engagement on farms. And of course, what we're talking about now is... Um, a lot of focus is on we, wanna, um, we want people to be engaged in agriculture. Producing food, sustaining agricultural systems in the US is incredibly important. Um, and one of the most exciting things is we're seeing that increasingly women want to be part of this. Um, so what we're going to turn to now, um, and um, we're going to discuss throughout the semester, is what we've seen in this century, which is a growing effort by men and women to break down the grass ceiling. Okay? So men as well um, have been eager to help 
um, shatter the grass. I don't know whether you can shatter a grass ceiling, mow the grass ceiling. I'm not sure what you would do with the grass ceiling. Um, but address, plow, okay, but plow these um, historical inequities within agriculture. And so what we've been seeing, and we're, we're going to talk about this, now that we have a sense of some of the history under our belt, where have we been? Um, we can see the importance of challenging some of the social norms and discourses around family farms and the contributions of men and women. Um, and we see men and women challenging that. We see women increasingly asserting the identity of farmer, that women, maybe women on your farm, it's similar. Uh, women increasingly saying, I'm not a farm wife, I'm a farmer as well as my husband, or my husband works off farm, and I'm the farmer. So women increasingly asserting the identity, uh, women increasingly um, working to access, close the gender gap, access the resources they need to be successful farmers, and we're also going to see examples of where women are creating new networks and organisations to help them be successful, to get the training and the skills they need um, to be successful, and I think all of this is helping us to increasingly see farm women. So thank you, and we will see you on Thursday. <laughs>